Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the two minute delay due to minor technical difficulties, uh, but hello and a very, very warm welcome to the sixth edition of Astronomy on Tap Cologne version. So today we have two very exciting speakers and two very exciting talks. I am Shashwata and I will be your host for the first part of this event. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Shomak Rajodri, who will speak about hidden mysteries in galaxies. Um, so Professor Rajodri, to give a brief introduction. So he is the director at the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics that is Ayuka and Short in Pune in India. Before that, he has held faculty positions. Well, I don't want to be too long, but he has been a faculty at the University of Birmingham. He has been the head of the department at, the Pre at Presidency University in Kolkata. And I can go on, but I want to finish the introduction with a brief personal note. So I met Professor Rai Chaudhary first as a 17-year-old undergraduate at uh, Presidency University when he was the head of the department there. And I can safely say that I have never met uh, somebody who is as inspiring and as exciting a person to talk to uh, in general, uh, particularly about science. And the reason I decided to do a PhD in astrophysics in the end, like many of my colleagues at that time, at least has partially to do with the fascination that he imbued us with. So I'm very excited to see what he will tell us today. Uh, I will hand over to him. Before that, uh, just a brief comment to our viewers on YouTube. If you have any question, please write it in the live chat. And at the end of the presentation, we will ask them to Professor Raichaudhuri. So Shomak sir, the presentation is around half an hour. And so you, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Ashwat. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. And I'm so glad that you can say uh, so many years later that, uh, that the using astrophysics because you, you, uh, I managed to uh, in, instill some enthusiasm with astronomy in you. That's wonderful to hear. As from, from a teacher, that's the best thing anybody can say to me. What I'm going to talk about today is, uh, uh, um, is, is, is uh, hit, uh, mysteries in black holes that was uh, uh, mysteries uh, in, in in galaxies and i'm going to concentrate on black holes because that nicely segues into the second half of today's um uh, today's uh, uh, um, uh, event uh, and uh, uh, galaxies in general are, are something i work on uh, using telescopes in in uh, different kinds I, I use telescopes in the optical part of the spectrum in the x-ray part of the spectrum radio part of the spectrum and uh, try to bring uh, various kinds of information from the different types of telescopes together on the same object and try to understand things from these different perspectives. And one of the uh, wonderful things that astronomers uh, do in general uh, is that from very sparse data, we have to bring together a story just like a detective arriving at the scene of crime many, many, many days after it has happened. And then from the faded clues that are there, you have to put together uh, the, the story. And, and, and for astronomers, we can't go and touch our objects. We can't go and, and, and actually visit our objects. We rely on very, very little information that comes to us in the various parts of the, the spectrum, both electromagnetic and gravitational now, and, and piece together a story. And so these hidden mysteries uh, have to be uh, unveiled. And one of the, the most important mysteries that you find in galaxies, and galaxies, what are galaxies? Galaxies are the basic building blocks of the universe. And the universe is made up of, I mean, just like matter is made up of, of molecules, the universe is made up of galaxies, and galaxies have stars in them. And, and, and gas and dust and, and dark matter and all kinds of things, but they are the basic units. So there are various kinds of galaxies. We live in a galaxy that's, um, that's a flat galaxy as of, of spirals with spiral structure in it, which is roughly about 75% of all galaxies are of, of this nature. And then there are nice and round galaxies, which are elliptical galaxies. And, and then these galaxies interact with each other. They, they collide with each other. They form bigger galaxies as they coalesce. So there's a lot of fun going on in the universe. The universe is very dynamic. And within these galaxies, there are lots of interesting things. And, and today, for today, I picked 
um, one of the one of these things, and that is uh, that is to talk about black holes. Our galaxy looks like this. If you look at our galaxy from the the an edge-on view, of course, you can't take a picture of our galaxy because we are inside the galaxy. But if you look at the edge-on view, you would see that we are um, a planet around uh, around a star that's not quite at the center. It's about uh, about uh, you, you know, uh, about 25,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy and in the plane of the galaxy. And in this, in the plane, there's a lot of dust that obscures light, which is going to be important when I talk later about the center of our galaxy. But at the center of the galaxy um, is would be here. And, and if we look through, as you can see, the, the plane of the galaxy is hard to see the, the plane of our own galaxy through this dust. If you look at uh, the, the galaxy from top, uh, uh, on a, a view from the top, not uh, edge on along the disk, it looks like this. There are five or so spiral arms. And as you can see, we are going around the galaxy. Uh, these galaxies are rapidly spinning, but we are in an orbit that goes around, our, we meaning the Earth, uh, along with the Sun, going around this galaxy. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we are one of the, the, the Sun, and together with the planets, is one of um, uh, uh, 100 billion such stars, presumably most of them have solar systems like us, with planets. And galaxies themselves, so I'll talk about one aspect of these galaxies, and galaxies themselves are various different kinds of, of, of black holes. I'll tell you in a minute what a black hole is. But in general, we have uh, black holes that are um, of the mass of a few times the mass of the sun. Uh, and there are some black holes that are um, a million to billion times the mass of the sun, and there's one per galaxy right in the middle, right in the middle of the galaxy, we know that there is a, a supermassive black hole. And, and that is, we don't know how they form. Uh, we know that the stellar mass black holes form from stars themselves as they, um, as they uh, go towards the end of their, uh, their, their uh, energy producing life. Some of the stars, the most more massive stars can produce black holes. And we are now also discovering that there are black holes that are, um, um, which are kind of uh, intermediate mass black holes between the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. And that probably provides a clue as to how supermassive black holes could form. But uh, we don't understand this aspect of black holes yet. What are black holes? So Newton talked about, uh, almost everybody here would have come across Newton's laws. And we know that, uh, so let's, let's look at gravity in the Newtonian sense, and let us try to introduce understand uh, black holes um, as Newton would. And uh, you can in, in principle, but in, 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 in detail, it is very difficult to do it. Uh, it. What Newton said that gravity is essentially a force, which um, uh, is, is something that uh, can be found between two objects that have mass and they pull each other and they pull each other uh, with a force that's proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So if you take away uh, objects away from each other, the force between them decreases. Now, if you are standing on such an object, like for example, the earth, then um, the earth is pulling you, you're pulling the earth. And so there is a mutual force that acts between them. And as a result, it is hard to uh, go away from the earth. In order to get away from the earth, you need a certain amount of kinetic energy, some energy, which uh, in the form of say a velocity that would, um, uh, would, would take you away from the earth. And from straight away school level Newton's laws, you get this, uh, get this idea of the escape velocity, which means that there is a certain velocity above which you have to attain. You have to attain at least a certain velocity in order to break free of gravity if you are attached to a planet or star or whatever. And, and to do that, you have to get this, this kind of a, the, the expression that's given here is, is proportional to the square root of mass and inversely proportional to the square root of the radius of the object on which you're standing. And this can be huge. For the Earth, the escape velocity is 11 kilometers a second or 43,000 kilometers per hour. And I can't drive that fast. Police will catch me if I do. And, and so really, it is hard to jump or to drive a vehicle off the face of the Earth. Similarly, the Earth cannot escape from the sun because the sun escape velocity is 600 kilometers a second. And the Earth is moving around the sun at about 30 kilometers a second. So these escape velocities are enormous. So even with this concept, a Newtonian concept, you can understand 
that if, for example, you have an, an object from which the escape velocity is the speed of light, Newton didn't know this, but we now know that the maximum one can attain uh, in, in, in velocity is the speed of light. You cannot exceed the speed of light. Um, and this is something Einstein taught us in the 20th century. Uh, we know that, so if something has um, uh, an escape velocity that's uh, near the speed of light, so for, even from Newton's laws, you can, you can conceive this, then nothing can escape from it. And that's the idea. So that's the idea of a black hole. At least conceptually, you can get from classical gravity the fact that you cannot escape if your escape velocity is, um, um, is, is, is the speed of light or more. Right? Now, how can you make an object such that its escape velocity is so high? One of the ways of doing this, because that escape velocity expression has uh, a, 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 an expression has m over r in it, you can, if you can take a mass, massive object like, say, a planet or a star, and you can condense it such that the r, the radius, becomes very, very tiny, then um, that, that escape velocity can be very, very high. So that, that's one way of doing it, to, to collapse something to a very tiny size. Now, is that possible? Now, you, in order to do that, what you have to do is, is you have to attain uh, uh, an expression which is given by Schwarzschild, called the Schwarzschild radius, or um, uh, which, which says that if you shrink an object of mass m to a size that is, um, that, that, is uh, uh, th that expression, which is 2gm over c squared, where c is the, the speed of light, then you, uh, your escape velocity becomes comparable to the speed of light. For the Earth, that is less than um, a centimeter. And so you can see it is very difficult to make the Earth into such an object. For a star like the sun, that expression is a few kilometers, three kilometers. And you can see that if you can take a, a star and, and make it uh, um, of a size of that kind, then you can, you can attain this, this kind of condition. Right. But then once you start doing that, the, the, even that expression that I showed you that comes from Schwarzschild cannot be obtained from the classical gravity that we know. That, that, and that is because Newton's description of gravity breaks down. If you um, are looking at velocities that are very close to the speed of light, and here you have to attain the speed of light uh, in terms of escape velocity, and, and, and comparable gravity uh, uh, cannot be described by Newton's uh, theory of gravity because it is, um, uh, it is incomplete. So um, Newton's idea that gravity is a force that acts between two objects actually was modified by Einstein uh, about 100 years ago, who essentially showed that gravity can be understood in a more general way by thinking of massive objects being such that um, it is, they are embedded in space-time. In, in Newton's theory, space is empty and light is massless. But in Einstein's theory, space has a character and it is, it is it, it, because of uh, matter, uh, something that has ma mass, uh, it, it bends space-time, and so locally, um, gravity bends uh, space-time, and, and things move in space along this bent or curved space-time. And that is what gives us the impression of gravitation. How does that work? So gravity is not a force, and, and even light, as it goes along uh, this, this curved space-time with that curved trajectories, which, which doesn't happen in Newton's, Newton's theory. So it turns out that in many, many cases where such experiments have been made, where there's distinction can be made between Newton's predictions and Einstein's prediction, it seems Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is the new theory of gravity, actually uh, describes uh, this, this, this very well. And one of the ways that it does describe uh, uh, gravitational phenomena is to look at what happens near black holes. So Einstein's idea is that uh, you have, a, say, the sun, uh, it, it curves the space-time around it, and then the Earth, which goes around the Sun, actually goes around the Sun because it is following this curved trajectory of, of space-time. The Earth also causes the space-time to curve a little, but it's, it's actually trapped around the Sun, like so. So Einstein gave us this idea of, of how to describe gravity quantitatively in order to describe things like black holes. Of course, you can describe all kinds of gravity from this, 
Karl Schwarzschild. Um, this was during the First World War, and um, um, when when Germany was at as, was at war with the English speaking world, and so a lot of this happened within Germany. The, the first publication of of, of, of the geometry of relativity, Karl Schwarzschild was in Göttingen. He was a mathematics professor, but he was actually he went to war uh, in the First World War at the Russian front, and he died there. Why? But just before he died. He, what he was doing, he was solving Einstein's equations while he was in, as, uh, working as a soldier. And he managed to solve Einstein's equations to describe what happens around uh, a black hole, which was not called a black hole then, but he actually found the, uh, a mathematical uh, expression for, for space-time around compact objects. And, and, and thus, from that, we get this expression that I showed you, which we call the Schwarzschild radius. Um, uh, and this was published by Einstein later on after Schwarzschild's death. But then people didn't know how, how to actually create these collapsed objects, which will then become a black hole and, and have space-time curved in that manner. And that was given uh, a couple of decades later by Subramanian Chandrasekhar working in Cambridge, uh, um, where he applied um, the new um, theory of quantum mechanics to um, um, Einstein's gravity and try to figure out what will happen as stars end their uh, nuclear fusion, uh, giving out radiation and thus go out of equilibrium and they collapse to form collapsed objects. And he worked out that above a certain mass, they will start collapsing into black holes. So Einstein's idea then of a black hole is that space time is so highly curved that, um, that nothing can climb out of these curved uh, uh, wells, as it were, and not even light. So if the sun, for example, the sun will not become a black hole, according to John Shaker's theory, but if the sun, sun became a black hole, what will happen is that the, the, the planets themselves will not feel um, the difference because the, the, the influence of a black hole doesn't go that far. It, it is a very local influence because as you see the space-time curvature, cur curvature actually is very important, um, very near the black hole itself. Um, from the planetary sense, the Earth will, will go around the, the sun uh, and, and, and feel its gravity from afar. But the black, the black hole itself is, um, is, is capable of drawing in matter uh, uh, from very nearby. Uh, the black hole itself. And that becomes important when you're trying to find these black holes. So for example, I, I showed you this picture of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and I, I shaped, I, I, I'm now telling you that there is a black hole right in the middle, in the, in the heart of the, um, of the galaxy, that is a supermassive black hole. And so I'm going to talk in the rest of uh, today, talk about two ways of finding black holes. One is how to find these supermassive black holes, which are the center of galaxies. And the second talk today, we'll talk in great detail about such things. And later on, I'll talk about how to find the black holes that are the stellar mass black holes, that there are hundreds of thousands of them spread around the galaxy and, and, and how we find them. So for example, in the, in the heart of the Milky Way, right in the middle here, there is a, a supermassive black hole. And the way to find it is to look at the orbits of stars that are very close to it. And this is the, uh, one of the, one of the uh, reasons uh, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded to the subject this year um, uh, was, was, to, was for the discovery and characterization of the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So the star cluster in the middle of our galaxy um, around Sagittarius A star, which is supposed to be the central black hole. Of course, you can't see the black hole in this picture because the black holes cannot be seen in light. Nothing comes out of the black hole. But the thing is that you, you have to, you, you can actually sense the black hole from the dynamics of things around it. Uh, for example, in the solar system, you can measure the mass of the sun by looking at the orbits of the planets. And so similarly here, if you can go very close, you can do, you, you can find the mass of this black hole. Now, what are the difficulties? The difficulties you saw in the picture of the Milky Way, that the plane of the Milky Way is full of dust. So it's very difficult to actually locate these stars, the light of the stars. And so one has to work in the near infrared uh, so um, the people who did this, for example, they worked at 2.2 microns, uh, which uh, uh, is, is uh, at, at which wavelength the dust becomes more and more or less transparent. Um, light goes through. It's the bluer light and the visual light that get blocked by the, uh, by, by the dust. And the second problem is if you want to go very, very close to the black hole, you're really looking at 
extremely um, uh, very close distances, angular distances on the sky. And the problem is that if you are looking through telescopes that are based on the Earth, stars twinkle, stars twinkle, because as the light comes through the atmosphere, it comes through various layers of the atmosphere with variable refraction. And as a result, the light from the same star arrives at very different places within a, a fraction of a second. And so if you take an image, uh, it, it blurs that image. And this is called seeing this variable refraction. So one of the things you have to do, and this is one of the telescopes that was used, for example, the Keck telescope in Hawaii, the other one is of course the VLT, the ESO telescope in Chile. And, 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 and what they have done in these telescopes is something called adaptive optics, where the, the, here is a telescope, it's a 10 meter telescope that's made out of 36 different um, uh, segments. And these segments themselves uh, form the surface of the, um, the, the mirror. And these can be deformed in real time to, in order to compensate for the change in um, the path of the, of the light through the atmosphere. And this is called adaptive optics. It actually compensates for atmospheric turbulence. This can be, of course, now done because, because things are computerized. And you can see adaptive optics can take the galactic center at 2.2 microns. It would be certainly blurred with a normal telescope, but you can actually resolve those stars and look at the stars themselves around the central black hole in our galaxy. And thus, um, um, the, 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 the work that was done starting in the early 90s produced this amazing orbits of stars. And you can see that scale is a tenth of an arc second, which is, uh, only can be achieved because of adaptive optics. And you can see that these stars, these, these orbits are actual orbits made up of um, of, of, of stars that have been monitored night after night after night, right from the early 90s in, uh, in, uh, to now. And you can see these stars. For example, that's, that yellow uh, orbit is the, is, the, is the star S2, very famous, uh, which has an orbit of 15 years. And uh, it's 15 years, like planets in the solar system. These are stars around the central black hole of our galaxy. And, and so these are the two groups, Reinhard Genzel, of course, in, in Munich, and, and uh, um, working with the VLT and, and Andrew Gez's group at UCLA, uh, working with the Keck, both worked on these systems. Um, Genzel started first, Gez followed, and, and both, both produced these amazing orbits. And if you look at these orbits, and then you fit uh, uh, relativistic um, Kepler's laws, uh, equations to them, you can get things like, I mean, and I've used normal, uh, Kepler's law here, you can, you can get something like four times 10 to the six times the mass of the sun. You can see four million times the mass of the sun, the supermassive black hole in the middle, right? And uh, you will hear more about supermassive black holes in the center of the galaxies in a, in, in a moment. But let's look at what else there is in the galaxy. The galaxy is now full of other black holes. These are dead stars, stars that have turned into black holes. Now, how, how would you uh, find them? And there are many ways of finding them. One of them, is through um, X-ray observations. And, and the way to do that is the following. More than 50% uh, of stars in the galaxy are, um, are in binary systems. So there are two stars that, that orbit each other, right? Our, our sun is, is, a, is an exception. We, have, we don't have a, a companion, but most stars have companions. Now, if you have a binary star, binary star then there'll be, uh, one will be larger than the other and more massive stars evolve faster. They say that one of them is a very massive star that turns into a black hole. It, it, it dies, it goes supernova and it leaves behind a compact object that is a black hole. Now you have a situation in which there's a normal star that's evolving around the black hole and they're going around each other, but it's very close to the black hole. So what happens is that as the normal star evolves and, and becomes very large, then its outer layers become more attracted to the black hole than the star itself. And so this matter will fall onto the, the compact object, which is the black hole. Now this matter that falls into the black hole doesn't fall in straight because it's got angular momentum. So it, it goes around the black hole and forms a little disk around it. This disk stays for a long time before the matter falls into the black hole. You can see that you probably can't see that black hole because that's a black hole, but you don't need to see it because the stuff that's outside, it's rotating in the form of a disk is going to have so much energy because of the gravitational potential energy of this black hole that's going to become very, very hot. 
This is an artist's impression of the same thing. You can see the black hole in the middle, but the disk that goes around it becomes hot. How hot does it become? 10 million degrees, 10 to the power seven degrees. And something that's that hot is, will, will emit X-rays. So you can see that we, I've talked about the supermassive black holes right in the middle of the galaxy, but these are the stellar mass black holes and, and all the middle mass black holes. If they are in, in a companion, if they have a companion that can donate matter to it, then they'll fall and, 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 and emit X-rays. And X-rays in the electromagnetic spectrum are those which have very high energy and very short wavelength. Now, the problem is that you cannot detect X-rays directly from, uh, from uh, uh, telescopes on the Earth because the atmosphere is completely opaque in this part of the spectrum. And so you have, this is why we had to wait till we had space technology you have to go and observe these things from space. And one of the things that I use quite a lot is, is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. There is an equivalent European X-ray Observatory called XM and Newton. Uh, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which was launched in 1999, is, is, has an exquisite, amazing imaging system where uh, it can produce X-ray images that are, are comparable to Hubble Space Telescope images which is a fraction of an arc second. And the way X-ray images are formed is also fantastic. I'm not going to go into the detail today. I don't have enough time. But X-rays normally, if you have imaging systems where um, optical images are formed through normal incidence, rays go and, and hit surfaces normally, but you can't do that with X-rays. X-rays go right through. So for X-rays, you have to have the X-rays incident on surfaces at a very, very small angle. And, and so uh, other uh, and so this is called grazing incidents. And in the case of these X-ray telescopes imaging systems, you you form these images by slowly guiding X-ray photons, which are very high energy, towards a focus like so. And and this is why uh, the the Chandra X-ray Observatory, for example, is is five meters long. It's got these uh, cylindrical mirrors, which uh, which have. Uh, uh, which, which focus X-rays through very small nudging every, uh, sur along the surfaces along uh, with the, the imaging system right at the, at the end there. And so what happens is that the gas falling in around this, this thing will then be imaged as X-ray blobs. So I'll give an example uh, towards the end of my talk. So here's uh, an example of uh, a galaxy I've worked on quite a lot, and that is Centaurus A. This is a very nice picture. Uh, which is an optical picture taken from a small telescope on the Earth. And it's a nearby galaxy. It's got a supermassive black hole right in the middle, but it's got lots of black holes dotted around here. But you're not seeing that here. You're seeing the stars in the galaxy, in the optical. And so if, what are stars? Stars are balls of gas that are a few thousand degrees hot. Our sun is 6,000 degrees. And it emits light uh, in normal light that our eyes can see. And so this, everything here in this particular picture is a few thousand degrees hot. Now you turn an X-ray telescope like Chandra in space and you point it towards this and, and we did that for about one and a half million seconds and you get an image like this. And here, the interesting thing is everything in this particular image is more than 10 million degrees hot. A few thousand degrees hot, a few million degrees hot. Same object, same scale. You see the central black hole in the middle uh, you see a jet coming out, relativistic speeds of uh, 10 to the power 7 degrees hot gas, which is, goes across the galaxy. And all those little things are X-ray binary stars. Many of them are neutron stars with normal stars, and many of them are black holes. I had a student who did an entire PhD thesis on each of these objects and, and modeled each of them and found which ones are black holes and which ones are not. And so here is a way of finding these black holes that are of stellar mass. So to, to summarize, we have black holes in galaxies, in the centers of galaxies one, and millions of them all around the galaxy. The smallest black hole we know so far um, is about, uh, um, about um, uh, three times mass, of the, about four times the mass of the sun. The nearest black hole we know so far in our galaxy is about 1600 light years away. So it's not coming for you, don't, don't worry. And I end by putting up a few books, if you want to read, read about Einstein, Einstein's gravity, read about black holes. Skip Thorne got the Nobel Prize recently. I think he's written the best popular book on black holes. And if you're interested in time, time, time travel, my recommendation is Richard Gott's book. I'll stop here and see if anybody has questions. 
Um, thanks a lot, Professor Raichaudhry, for this fascinating talk and also for the reading suggestions. I have to say I haven't read any of them, so definitely try to uh, time to try out. So um, the YouTube video often lags by one or two minutes. So while we wait, if in case our viewers have any immediate questions, I will ask uh, maybe the first question. So uh, one question I wanted to ask is that, so you said, mm -hmm. talked about the supermassive black holes and said that we, we kind of don't really know how they form, but what are the main theories? Do they form from like very large stars or from many stars? So. So it's very interesting. That's a, uh, Shashata is a very, very interesting question. Uh, the thing is, of course, we know, don't know. Um, there has been a lot of uh, um, uh, con uh, controversy on this issue. Uh, there are many theories. First of all, when we never found the, the black holes in the middle, then uh, there is one theory, of course, that uh, in the middle of a galaxy where the density of stars is the highest, um, small black holes can merge <clears throat> hierarchically to form bigger and bigger black holes. But then people said, where are the intermediate black holes? You should have black holes in the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of solar masses, but they were not found. But recently we started finding them, <clears throat> but I didn't talk about the LIGO discoveries, but LIGO has discovered recently three um, black holes of more than hundred solar masses, the maximum being 140. So we can find these things. But still the question is, can you have, do you have enough time in the age of the universe for small black holes to merge to form million solar mass black holes? And, uh, and are there enough such black holes in, in various parts of the galaxy? It's very difficult to know. The other kinds of theories talk about how, um, how um, uh, you can, these things can be formed in the early universe when the universe was very small and things that were formed in that, that time, the primordial black holes were very different from the kinds of stars that are formed now. In fact, um, uh, one of the early theories of Martin Rees and Heinholt said that you might actually have black holes formed before galaxies, seeding galaxies, galaxies forming around these black holes. So that's something that people have toyed with for a long time. So I would say that it's an open question now how supermassive black holes are formed. We do not know. We know very well how normal stellar mass black holes are formed. And the LIGO discoveries are showing us wonderful ways of how black holes actually merge. They're showing us black holes merging into um, into bigger black holes. So we've seen black holes of 30 and 40 solar masses come together to, and, and those events emit gravitational waves and we are detecting them in LIGO. And, and recently we found one in, in, in which a 60 solar mass black hole and an 80 solar mass uh, black hole have joined together to form 140 solar mass black hole. So we can see black hole merging happen. So clearly these things, uh, these things evolve. So it's a very exciting time in which we are trying to discover how, things, how these things evolve. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's, it's really crazy how much we don't know, despite the fact that we have also come a long way. There are a couple of questions from the, from the viewers. So one question is, what is the most massive black hole that has been analyzed? I guess either the name or how massive it is? Well, <clears throat> the supermassive black holes, there are black holes that are, um, uh, that are uh, ten, a few times 10 to the 9 solar masses. I'm sure the next talk will talk about a few. I mean, you know that there has been an event horizon mapping of the <clears throat> black hole in the center of M87, where, which again is a few times 10 to the 9 times the, the mass of the, of the sun. And uh, we, can, we can go you know, in, in, in that range of a few times 10 to the 9. That's the supermassive black holes. And in the stellar mass black holes, the most uh, massive that has been found, as I just said, is 140 times the mass of the sun. And, and that is very difficult to justify in terms of a stellar product because the most massive star in our galaxy is 100 times the mass of the sun. So uh, it is hard to know how you can find uh, uh, black holes that massive. But in this particular case, we found it uh, in, in the process of two black holes merging to form it, right? So we now know that black holes merge to form more massive black holes. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if once LIGO starts off again, we will start finding black holes in this regime of, of a few hundred times the mass of the sun. And that's, that will be very, very exciting. That's, that's indeed true. And also with LIGO projects, I'm really curious to see what comes up. Also with LIGO India, big part for Indian scientists as well. Um, there is another that's question. That's something I haven't talked about. Of course, I'm 
yeah. in sitting in, in Ayuka, where one of, one of the things that we are leading here is to build the third LIGO. And we've just started working on it right now, and we hope to build one by 2027. And, and uh, by that time, this whole technology will have evolved quite a bit. Very exciting time. That that indeed is amazing. Like 2027 is it's is six years. It's not even that far. Um, there is another question which is says that I thought I heard a recent press release talk about a black hole at the edge of the solar system. Is there really a black hole there at the edge of the solar system? I, I have no idea. Do you know anything? No, no. Well, um, actually, there have been there's been a lot of speculation. Uh, about uh, mini black holes, black holes that are, uh, are you know, um, uh, very, very tiny planet-sized black holes and stuff like that. Um, now, um, from microlensing, there have been uh, very tiny black holes that have been found in, um, in for example, in, in the Large Magellanic Cloud and various parts of, uh, of our galaxy that have uh, come as a, as, as a very transient event. Now, those are, um, uh, but, a part of the solar system, you know, it's very difficult to know. I mean, uh, dark planets have been speculated. I mean, the fact that we uh, very far away small planets, but uh, having um, having a black hole at the at the um, edge of the solar system would cause quite a lot of very interesting effects. In particular, um, you you can if if they were there, then you probably and it's like planet size, planet mass size, or whatever. Um, it would create quite a lot of detectable. Uh, lensing effects, uh, gravitational lensing effects, which would be very interesting. But I have not uh, seen any any um, uh, believable uh, detection of such a thing. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I mean, claims come and go. I mean, we have to take everything with a bit of salt, I guess. So that's how science works. Yeah. Um, so I think we will stop here for now. If there are any further questions, then maybe at the end of the talk, we can come to something. I thank Professor Rajodri again a lot for this really interesting talk. If you were in Cologne with us in live in person, we would have offered you a beer. But oh, yeah, this is Astronomy on Tap, um, maybe, not, maybe some other time. And otherwise, I uh, hand over to my colleague Craig for the second part of this session. All right. Thank you very much, Shash. Thank you again, Professor Veshkari. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, so now it's time for our second presentation. Um, so I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Vladimir Kudyashov. Um, I met him when I was still doing my master's degree in. Um, Bradbrod University in Nijmegen, Netherlands. Uh, he, he started there in 2018, I believe. Uh, and that's when I was just finishing my master's degree. Um, so I was uh, very happy to make this contact. And now he's willing to give a presentation for us about his work at the Radboud Radio Lab. And it sounds super exciting uh, on the Event Horizon Imager. Um, so Vladimir. Uh, thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So, Craig, thanks for introduction and uh, thanks to previous speaker who who, who touched this uh, this topic of of, of of black holes. Well, uh, my talk will be something uh, a bit different because it will not be about the science you can do with black holes. It will be rather about technology you need to do more and more science using black holes as the lab, okay? So here on the screen, you can see the uh, first ever image of the black hole obtained using Event Horizon Telescope. And this image was released, I believe, in April of 2019. This is the famous image of the black hole. Uh, later on, it uh, this uh, achievement, it got a breakthrough prize of 2020 for the first image of, of the black hole and some other prizes, I, I believe. And recently, it attracted also Henry Draper Medal for uh, basically the medal was awarded awarded to uh, Shepard Doleman, who is uh, head of HD, and to Heino Falke from Radboud University, who is uh, science head of HD, I think. Uh, so uh, the uh, website tells that both scientists are pivotal in realizing and imaging uh, the black hole in M87, supporting Einstein's theory of relativity. 
Okay. And now I think I can uh, go to my presentation because this I believe makes the the best, <laughs> let's say, starting point for for my presentation. Uh, so the idea is. Uh, what science can we do except of 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 eht uh, please give me a moment i'm trying to realize whether the zoom uh, blanks or not any part of my slide i hope it will be good now so we have black hole image but science people they are saying that okay this is very good but we want even better black hole image sharper uh, so science people are saying that uh, to uh, to do selection between competing theories of gravity, they would like to uh, to have the image with uh, from instrument from radio interferometric instrument with uh, beam size order of uh, one tenth of the source size. Another issue is that the UV coverage of EV EHT is not enough. So the beam pattern itself, it is, it is, it is not as good as, as they would like to, to have in the instrument. So, in, so at the end, they would like to have better UV coverage than here. As well, they would have to, uh, they would like to get uh, to have longer baselines, and or higher frequency. And uh, I'm working for Event Horizon Imager. That is instrument design project of Redbout Radio Lab, or it's it would be better to say led by Redbout Radio Lab because quite a bunch of entities and experts from other parties are also involved. And the uh, the main uh, goal of of this uh, instrument is to do time average image of a black hole like SAJ or M87. Well, SAJ is not very very stable in time so well anyway uh, the uh, the idea is to launch into space uh, telescope satellites carrying a very long baseline interferometer and to do observations at uh, high frequencies above 500 gigahertz uh, to obtain sharp enough image and the reason for that is that uh, one of black holes is in the center of our galaxy and the interstellar clouds they uh, they effectively broaden the instrument beam so whatever good is your angular resolution uh, you have limitation from this uh, propagation media and to overcome that limitation uh, to get the angular angular resolution you want you have to observe at frequency above 500 gigahertz. This is not very sharp number. This is ongoing science, but this is kind of one of beacons. Huh? So observation frequency should be above 500 gigahertz. As well, you want angular resolution, uh, five micro arc seconds, more or less. And for that, you need a distance between radio telescopes comparable to Earth size or even bigger. And as previous speaker uh, said, uh, when you think about atmosphere at very, very long distance between dishes, and you think about stars twinkling, you realize immediately that the uh, path of, of the same signal to, uh, towards two dishes on, on the Earth, uh, this path, well, geometrically, it's supposed to be the same. But because of atmosphere turbulence on very, very long baselines, and because of very, very short uh, wavelengths you have at frequency like 500 gigahertz, Basically, it will be very, very technically challenging, if possible at all, to do it from the ground. So this is the main reason to go to space. And here on this slide, uh, you have comparison of image obtained with our space configuration that I will explain a bit later. At 230 gigahertz, scattered by interstellar medium. And at frequency three times higher, 690 gigahertz, you can see that we get a lot more details. These images have been simulated and published by Frey Krulovs and Heino Falke in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, in fact, I, um, 
during the uh, the preparation of slides, I realized that I, I have a lot of acknowledgements. So I thought, okay, better I, I say once, uh, let's say main, main cast, <laughs> because otherwise it will be, it will take too long. <laughs> because the thing I'm presenting, it's obviously not my own work. It's, it's work of a big team. So science PI is Heino Falke from Radboud University. Technology PI is Manuel Martineira from Space Agency. Uh, postdoc is me, the presenter, Volodymyr. PhD students are Christian Brinkering and Freik Rolofs. By the way, Freik is a doctor. He defended on 28th of October. So congratulations again to Freik. Uh, there are also two master, uh, one master student, uh, Schlenzova, Anastasia, and one master of science student, Bob Boer, who would uh, work on multivalent study. And a part of that, there is, uh, I, I tried to count people involved. I stopped counting after 35. <laughs> I also realized that number of entities involved is, is like tens already. So it's, it's quite a big thing. And sometimes I will be not able to, to refer to exact people. So the, the main science idea, as I said, is to select between competing theories of gravity. For that, uh, you need instrument with angular resolution about one tenth of, of the um, object size. But the thing is that black holes, they are tiny small in, in, in sense of angular size that you, that you can actually observe. So looking at this table here, uh, you can see a list of, let's say, biggest black holes. Huh? And two of them are very, very, very special because they are much bigger than others. So they are SAJ and M87. Because you can see that the shadow size is about 50 micro seconds. You, you realize immediately that you need angular, angular resolution of five micro seconds. There are also other uh, secondary science goals or candidate science goals uh, that people are discussing, such as time resolved imaging of SAJ, uh, waterline imaging at 557, for example, at, uh, at, at Digital to look for, to look at planet forming disks. Uh, but my talk is about more technical stuff. And uh, this, uh, this technical side is mostly pointed towards the principal science goal to obtain time-resolved image with angular resolution of five microseconds. So technology. Uh, I like very much this triangular picture of interferometer. So it's a, <laughs> I think it suits very well for this format of astronomy on tap. So the thing is that when you are going to build an interferometer, uh, you have to take care of, of, of your sensitivity, that is delta T. You have also to, to think about the information you have about the delay and delay rate model. And you need very good uh, coherence between uh, dishes involved in, inter in interferometer. Otherwise, you do not have, uh, uh, you do not get any funding. So you do not get any money. So this is very, very basic idea of interferometry in this format. Uh, so technology, the only payload instrument that can deliver such an angular resolution is very long baseline interferometer. There is no other technology that can even approach such angular resolution. Observation bands. Uh, there is a motivation due to interstellar scattering to go to 500 gigahertz or above. As well, imaging in planet forming disks, it would require observing at 557 gigahertz. So it seems from technical side feasible to stick at 557 gigahertz. Uh, as well, it, it, it is not clear that it may be practically possible to observe from ground at long baselines at such frequency or to observe in concert with ground at such frequency there due to atmosphere. This is why this highest frequency band, it is for space, for space only. The second observation band is to operate in concert with EHT. The EHT band is 230 GHz, and the new band in EHT is about 350. It will be seen in further work which band is better for, for uh, time-resolved imaging or for comparing images that we obtain from ground on, on, for space. And the third band is to be uh, confirmed but perhaps it will be 43 gigahertz for uh, fringe tracking or for bootstrapping. So the, uh, the thing is that the baselines are so long 
that correlated flux of the source decays very much, as you can see on, on this plot on the bottom right. So the, the blue uh, dashed line, it is the system noise at the longest integration time uh, you can get from the cell crossing time. And green, thing, uh, green dots and green lines, they are simulated source flux. So you can see clearly that uh, the longest half of baselines, it actually features the, the signal, uh, the signal to noise ratio that is not any good for any detection. You, you, you cannot detect directly easily here. And this model is at 690 gigahertz. But when you drop the frequency, you see immediately that the signal to noise ratio is at least 11 at 43 gigahertz. So the idea is that, okay, maybe we do detection at low frequency and then we uh, eight higher frequency channel with this detection and then we go ahead uh, with this idea up to the highest frequency channel. So the payload instrument is very long baseline interferometer. We have at least three observation bands. The distance between dishes should be up to 25,000 kilometers for the main science goal. And the smallest distance should be as small as few tens of meters as limited by uh, altitude and orbit control systems as suggested by expert, experts in ESA. This is needed for uh, imaging of uh, planet forming disks. And uh, we also have to observe a two orthogonal polarizations. Uh, yep, perhaps that's it. And uh, th there are three, let's say, main cornerstone things uh, in, the, in the concept we, we are studying. So the mode is connected element field bi. Why? Because uh, the observation frequency is so high that we basically do not see a practical possibility to, to, to go with separate independent oscillators. So we have to do some kind of frequency transfer. Uh, second, as you can see from the plot, we, we cannot do direct detection. So we have to aid the detection by bootstrapping and uh, relative navigation in space. As well, uh, there are frequency allocations for downlink and availability of, of, of ground stations that can receive IR uh, data from, from our flying dishes. And at the end, uh, it, it seems that downlink for the uh, raw IF data, it is impractical. So we are thinking about space correlator that will uh, correlate on the flight in a delay and delay rate window in order to shrink the, uh, the data rate. We are aware that uh, the size of the delay and delay rate window, it depends on, the, on our knowledge of, of, of relative uh, position velocity between satellites. And we are uh, working on a simulation of realistic numbers. Uh, this is a brief overview of, of, of activities we have, but first of all, Craig, would you please tell me how much time do I, do I have? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> maybe another 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Okay. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. So uh, just in short, uh, there's industrial study at GMV Innovative Solutions. Uh, to simulate uh, orbital scenario visibility of uh, GNSS transmitters such as GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, Baidao, etc. And to tell us what is the simulated accuracy at our orbital scenario. There is postdoc at ESA and postdoc of ESA, Radboud and NWO, this is Dutch um, organization. And uh, there is one PhD study and one master study at, at Radboud. There is launching activity launching master study in bootstrapping and the the all uh, the whole EHI benefits from the fact that white papers on related topics have been submitted to both ESA and NASA hence a big mission proposal is in ESA selection pipeline uh, as well uh, some proposals on EHI have been selected for example uh, the technology demonstrator pathfinder mission is passing now through evaluation and the main PI Airbus have been invited to present it in ESA in early 2021. 20, this is very good for us to, to test, uh, well, if, if we can, to test our critical technologies in space. I would like to tell you 
very, very briefly about uh, two of such critical technologies about uh, frequency transfer to assure coherence and about relative navigation. Uh, I think I can manage to do it in five, five or seven minutes. So the uh, connected element uh, mode is based on concept uh, from Manuel Martin Neira. This concept is not published yet, so it's it's on on its way to be to become published. The concept is, is very very simple. Uh, so the idea is that you have uh, two separate satellites, one on top, one on bottom. I hope you can see my 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 pointer. So you, you have two um, simple oscillators. One on board satellite one, another on board satellite two. So you split signal of oscillator. One of parts of split signal you keep it with you, and another part you send it to your counter satellite by bidirectional link. And you do the same at, at, at another satellite. So what you have, you have at the end your own signal, and also you have the signal you received from the counter satellite. You do the sum of these signals on board two satellites. And the idea of the, the main idea of the concept is that the sum will be same or very, very similar on board both satellites. So this is the idea that sum is, is same as well, because oscillators generally, they work at frequencies such as tens of megahertz or one hundredths of megahertz. Uh, and our local oscillators are 500 or 600 gigahertz. We have to do frequency multiplication. So we also realize that uh, we have to be careful and we have to think where, where do we multiply the frequency. Uh, this is not important now. Uh, this is a picture of experimental setup built here in European Space Agency. So here you have, you can see two twin breadboards and the optical link simulator. And this is zoom in of, of one of breadboards. It consists of Owen controlled crystal oscillator that is way <laughs> smaller than hydrogen maser. Uh, and then uh, its frequency gets, uh, then you have PLDRO and tripler to go from 100 megahertz to 25 gigahertz, 25.8 to be precise. And output of the tripler is split between communication link and mixer. And another input of the mixer, it, it gets signal from signal received from counter satellite. So output of the mixer is mixer is the sum frequency frequency multiplied by two. And the, uh, the output frequency is 103.2 gigahertz. Uh, and th this frequency will be useful at, at the next step of the work that will be demonstration on site of uh, IRAM in French Alps. Uh, this is the obtained performance. Let's start with the plot on, on right hand side. Uh, this is the phase difference between two local oscillators at 100 gigahertz in degrees with respect to time in hours. As you can see, the, the, the noise is like 1.5 degrees plus minus three sigmas. That is actually fantastic because it's, it, it, it's a phase difference between two 100 gigahertz oscillators. And if you uh, put uh, breadboards on thermal controllers and you play with temperature difference between them, uh, uh, you, you may discover something even better. So let's look at the, at the left side. The, phase uh, difference, it follows the temperature profile. So at the end, if we, uh, well, discovery number one is that the, because realistic temperature control systems in satellites, they, they can do much better than plus minus three degrees. We are basically very much safe. And second thing, second discovery is that if we can do uh, good thermal, uh, thermal control, then the phase difference will be basically just flat thing. That's very good. And this is the Allen deviation. You, uh, you need to calculate coherence of your interferometer. This is measurement result. It's more than 14. And uh, we also measured uh, that the performance decays by factor of 2.15 uh, when we increase the communication link length from five kilometers, we have now to 25,000 kilometers. That is the longest delay in EHI. Still, the margin towards the requirement is at least eight times. It sounds very good, but when you calculate the coherence that you use in, uh, in, in uh, sensitivity equation, you can see that uh, the actual uh, margin you bring to the whole system, it's about 18%. 
that is not eight times, but this is very useful because we, we lack signal noise ratio. And uh, Craig, now uh, I think I have two or three minutes only, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now the main uh, idea we, 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 with navigation is that uh, we can build, uh, let's call it extended Kalman filter to blend together multi constellation relative uh, navigation, optical uh, intersatellite link that measures for us range and range rate, and other sensors if we want. So the idea is that from GNSS, we have some, uh, some error. So it's, it's ellipsoid or, or a ball. Yeah? And then the laser, it's very precise, but it is precise only in, in one direction. So we shrink the ball to a Frisbee or to, to a thin disk. And then the third step is to use bootstrapping uh, technique to shrink the disk to a small coin. So this is very, very high level explanation. And this is simulation result, not experiment, simulation. As you can see, uh, this is only GNSS without lasers between satellites. So on intersatellite distances up to 50 kilometers, our accuracy is order of four centimeters. When we increase the distance, naturally, the accuracy drops down. Why? Because the number of GNSS transmitters in the common visibility, it drops. Huh? So uh, when you convert these things into numbers you need for delay and delay rate model, you can see that in relative position, for example, in short baselines, you get uh, something like four centimeters error. In relative velocity, it is two centimeters per second. And this is not a disk yet. So we, we did not edit laser link so far, uh, but I appreciate very much that uh, GMV who simulated this, they, they, they permitted me to show these slides because this, this is the, the scenario for basically for science missions. So this is very, very useful. Uh, basically that's it. The coherence is achieved in the lab. This is TRL4 uh, and we are going to, we are speaking now to, to radio telescope, whether they will permit or not us to, to do uh, experiment on site of, of, of uh, Plateau de Bure uh, interferometer to go from TRL4 to TRL5. Uh, and the industrial study simulates the navigation performance. So things are going quite well, I would say. And your questions are welcome. All right, thank you very much. That was a nice presentation. Uh, yes, again, there's a bit of a lag between YouTube and this conference. So I can begin by asking, um, so this instrument is supposed to go into space and then observe from space. Maybe I missed it, but uh, when are you projected to start the space-based sort of tests? Well, the, the true answer for, for seminar on TED <laughs> is we can start it when we have money for that. Uh, so the thing is that uh, you have critical technologies and then uh, you look at, at their technology readiness level. So you start from mathematical concept and simulations in the lab. So you progress from TRL1 to TRL3, 4, 5, blah, blah, blah. And then when you have something ready to be launched in space, it's TRL8. TRL and when you have something that is space proven in your scenario, it is TRL9. So at the moment, our critical technologies are uh, TRL4 uh, in sense of oscillators, in sense of relative navigation. It is not easy to say because something is simulated and something can be adopted from LISA or from GRACE or from NGGM. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's, it's quite, a di quite a discussion, but uh, I hope very much that if Pathfinder mission is selected, then it it can fly in 2013. Okay. 2013. Okay, uh, that sounds nice. Um, yeah, one question here we have is um, which black hole other than Sagittarius A star or M87 um, would it be possible to image? Or is it possible to under, to know that yet? <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, look, 
in this table, we have list of black holes. Uh, those have the biggest size. So with, with our pixel size, uh, the best images will be for, for, for these uh, six black holes. We can also think of uh, making images of other black holes, but that will be not, uh, let's say, very, very much detailed image because the black holes are quite small. Yeah, I, I guess that would be a major issue is how big this black hole is uh, that you would want to image. Um, Rick, can I ask a question? Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Yes, I mean, uh, Vladimir, very, very fascinating uh, talk. I mean, I, I just, uh, I want to know uh, this Pathfinder missions you're talking about. So in the planning, how many Pathfinder missions would you need? Just would one would do? And what, in, what are you going to test in the Pathfinder mission? The electronics? Or uh, because, you know, Pathfinder mission, if it's a single thing goes up, then you're not actually testing interferometry. So what are the what is the, the the most important thing that you really test in the Pathfinder mission? Uh, it's not uh, one thing. It's not one thing, uh, because we need very high frequency. Uh, yeah. We have to test uh, the coherence. So here on on the uh, on the left plot, you see the requirement in black. Yes. And uh, space oscillators listed in in the legend, and also the best uh, oscillator existing. Uh, Let's say the best oscillator I know that is I measure three thousand. This is measure of 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 uh, mm. EHT. This is not for space. It it looks like fridge fridge for for beers, so you cannot launch it in space. If if you even pull it to second floor, it it will not work well <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so yeah. even with this machine, you cannot integrate longer than forty seconds at five hundred fifty seven yeah. gigahertz. But what you want is to integrate over four four hundred fifty seconds. Mm. So. From 40 to 450. How, how how do you cover this? But if if you if you look at space clock, for example, uh, hydrogen maser in uh, in mm -hmm. assess, then you get only 10 seconds. But you want again 450. What do you do? You do frequency transfer. For example, following a lab study that I presented. But you have to test it in lab. Then you have to test it on radio telescope. Then you have to test it with temperature and other things. And then you can can launch it in space. So Pathfinder has to test this uh, oscillators that can deliver coherence. Another yeah. thing uh, Pathfinder has to test is the relative navigation or detection that would be good enough to make uh, the EHI uh, feasible. Because mm. look, look, looking at this, at this plot, uh, I can see that it's, it's quite challenging to do detection. So this is second uh, cornerstone thing. Uh, and other things, they are smaller, but they also exist. So two main things are uh, coherence and detection. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we have another question um, in the audience. Can such a tight coupling of the oscillators between the remote oscillators, can that have an application outside of radio astronomy, for example, in telecommunications? Thanks. That's it. We thought about that. Uh, at the moment, uh, well, most of all, we thought about uh, making something good for for uh, for Lisa mission. But then we realized that okay, we we are ten to fifteen times better. Sometimes we are thirty times better than the requirement for us. But we are still ten times. Uh, we lack ten times performance to Lisa, so we have to improve the setup, and then maybe we do it uh, for telecoms. Well. We we didn't try really hard to find applications so far because it is really the dedicated development. So we have been really focused to, to deliver the results so far. Okay. Another question in developing such um, cutting edge technology, what is the biggest challenge that you normally face in your everyday life in work? I would say not the biggest challenge, the biggest luck is to have colleagues who can really help, who can alleviate some issues, who can suggest what things to do. Uh, but biggest challenge, no. I, I would not say anything like that. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yeah, if we had this in person, then I could buy you a beer, but maybe after the pandemic, when I, maybe when I'm back in Dimension.
Okay. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks no for worries. Pushing. And uh, if you want to stay on until after the event, then we can all talk and after we, we're not live. But um, right now, I am going to present some of the recent news in astronomy. Our last event was on November. So there's a few months of recent news. But we'll, so we tried to get um, some of the most exciting news. Um, let me just start the slideshow. All One second. Sorry, okay, I have it set now. So, to present the news over the past month, well, past few months, because we haven't presented since um, November, but um, one of the, yes. So um, there was a press release um, talking about how Saturn's moons can cause an axial tilt. Um, so the, the moons seem to be migrating away from Saturn. And then um, some observations are saying that this Saturn is beginning to tilt. And so initially the astronomers thought that because the moons were so close initially, that kept the rotation and Saturn somewhat um, in line. But now as they're migrating away, Saturn's starting to tilt. But now further analysis uh, into the history of Saturn's motion and uh, the motion of the other planets, there was actually some residence event that happened billions of years ago um, with Neptune. And because Neptune was a bit closer, um, there was some resonance event that caused Saturn to begin to tilt. Um, and then this, that's when it was initiated and then it's continued. And now it's starting to get um, more noticeable that the, the moons are starting to get further away from Saturn and the, it's, it's starting to tilt a bit more. Um, and doing a similar analysis on say Jupiter or uh, Uranus, they're noticing that those planets are also starting to tilt. Um, and over the next few billion years, it'll, the tilt is supposed to double in size for Saturn. Um, not that we'll be around to see it, but one of the things that astronomers look at. Uh, and then um, exciting news, well, exciting news that they're still working. Uh, so the Voyager missions were launched decades ago, um, and now they've exited the solar system. Um, but they're still operational, or at least they, they have some instruments that are still operational. For example, detecting cosmic rays, um, particles moving very fast, um, electrons usually. But um, they're still operating. So they actually turned and they, they looked um, towards the solar system after it, it is left the threshold of our solar system. Uh, so there's known that there's some interaction between the magnetic field of the sun that uh, affects the entire solar system and the interstellar magnetic field outside of the solar system. And that there's a shock front on the edge of the solar system where the, the, uh, the particles are a bit denser because it's moving between different media. So uh, think of just moving between two densities or if you have two different liquids that, that have different densities and you can get a separation between them. Um, so it's somewhat like that. It's this interface between the two different densities and because the sun is moving, um, this is actually a shock front. And, uh, Shock fronts normally have particles that accelerate and particles are effect, affected and things like that from the magnetic field. And what the Voyager missions noticed was that there was a stronger cosmic rays or more energetic cosmic rays than they would expect. And it's because they have actually accelerated now that they're in this less dense um, interstellar medium. They've, started to accelerate so they could detect these cosmic rays before the rest of the shock front. 
and it's the first time anything like that has been detected, obviously because we haven't sent anything else into um, the interstellar medium. Um, and it's taken 40 years or 50 years for these probes to get that far. So it's very difficult to detect if you wanted to. Yeah, there's a nicer image of Voyager. Um, yeah, so th this was a whole debate last year. Um, and there, there was a huge press release when it was first mentioned. The, the initial study from a UK team that there's phosphine in, or more phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus than uh, what's expected. And that's actually a sign that there might be some habitable life in Venus. And then people come up with all these theories about how there's alien life in our solar system. And yeah, uh, another hit in 2020. But this was actually a, a false, uh, it was improperly analyzed data was the issue. Um, so there is not more phosphine in Venus or in, in the atmosphere. So they were detecting in the more in the cloud regions just a little bit above the um, ground of Venus. But Venus has, uh, well, it's very close to the sun. It has a lot of sulfur in its atmosphere. It's not really the ideal conditions to have life develop in it. But they detected this element, uh, this molecule, and then they thought that maybe it can host some life that we haven't found yet. But uh, a reanalysis of this data is that it, it's not a detection of more phosphine in the clouds. Um, they said more, off, more likely than not, there's a closer line um, from sulfur dioxide that is the cause of this emission that they were detecting. Um, the authors still claim that they properly checked for the sulfur dioxide and took that out of the measurement before they announced their measurement of phosphine. So they reanalyzed the data, they reprocessed the raw data. Um, <clears throat> and then they're still adamant, they're saying that, yeah, I mean, they, they didn't detect as much phosphine as they announced in the press release, but they're still saying that there's some phosphine in the atmosphere. Although now they're saying that it's in the mesosphere, so a lot higher up in the atmosphere. So rather than a few kilometers up, there's more like 80 kilometers above the surface of Venus. They're detecting phosphine. So this is an ongoing debate, but we just need more observations. It shows that even something so close to Earth, scientists still argue about it. Um, but yeah, another piece of news is that FAST, the 500 Aperture Spherical Telescope, is now operational and it's allowing international scientists to uh, book some observing time. So FAST is a radio telescope um, similar to Arecibo, the late Arecibo. Uh, so this was built in a big, uh, cab a big um, valley <clears throat> and they can get 500 meters across um, for the size of this telescope. Um, and so where Arecibo was um, about 300 uh, meters across. And it also had, um, it was stationary. Well, both of them, like they don't tilt or anything. So they're both stationary in that sense. But Arecibo um, was just a smooth surface, um, reflecting surface. And for fast, this is made up of um, 4,400 different aluminum um, panels. And they can shift, so they can focus on um, some point that they want, or whichever point in the sky that they want. And most likely they would have to slew with it and follow it. Um, but it, it's interesting that they have these panels that can shift and they can focus it where they need to go. Um, unfortunately, it's, I mean, our SIBO was super nice because it was, you could do radar, radar astronomy. So it had a transmitter as well. And you could transmit a signal um, and study, say, uh, one of the planets in the solar system. And then it could um, transmit a signal to bounce off the planet and then um, analyze the signal that comes back. Uh, but that is not 
what FAST does. FAST is just a detector. Um, but it's now fully operational and it's taking international scientists um, at least some applications for observing time. So that's very nice. And FAST um, can be used for so many things because um, <clears throat> it has already detected a, a large number of pulsars and it can be used for studying exoplanets or it can detect um, the neutral hydrogen in the galaxy, which is um, big point of research for some people that study galaxies, um, such as myself. Um, but yeah, th this is very exciting. Um, so maybe I can get observing time on fast. Uh, but speaking of pulsars, um, there's something called the pulsar timing array. So if you look at a pulsar, it has a very steady uh, rate at which it pulses. We'll say that. Um, so by looking at actually millisecond pulsars, this is what NanoGrav did. They looked at millisecond pulsars because they had um, a very steady um, pulsation rate and they're not prone to all the spurious events of normal pulsars. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> just from the physics that's involved in a millisecond pulsar. So NanoGrav has Looked, observed and studied these millisecond pulsars for over a decade. Um, and then they, they corrected it for any noise or spurious events. And they're still detecting that there is some um, oscillation, so to speak, of the um, millisecond pulsar periods or the, the rates that they can detect from the millisecond pulsars. And they're saying, I mean, they, they haven't proven it because it, this is not very well studied at this point, but they're saying that this could be an indication that there's a gravitational wave background or some background um, gravitational wave medium in the uh, galaxy. Um, so it, yeah, there's clear evidence of a signal, uh, uh, some shift in their signal, but uh, there's no clear evidence for a gravitational wave background yet. Um, I mean, the, the theory needs to be developed a lot more, but this is still very interesting and I look forward to whatever they do in the future. Um, one more event, I guess, that happens this month. Uh, so in two weeks, um, Perseverance, the, the Mars rover from NASA is supposed to land on Mars. So uh, there will be a live, a live stream, a live um, commentary live tweeting, I guess, of this event and from NASA. And if you go to that YouTube page, I mean, you can't click on the screen, obviously, but I'll add it in the description of the video. But um, this YouTube video, they had a, a trailer that they made for this event and it's very well produced. And uh, that image is a still from the video. But um, this should be very exciting to see this all work out. I mean, perseverance and ingenuity, I forgot to talk about ingenuity, but that's the, the helicopter that's also on the same flight. Um, they, they've turned on periodically on their trip to Mars just to make sure that everything's working correctly still and that the batteries are charged well enough to uh, sustain it and so that it can activate and land properly. But it'll be interesting to see what sort of things we can get once it arrives and it is fully functional. But yeah, so that's 18th of February. So be sure to watch it. Other than that, I mean, uh, this is all I have to present. Um, <clears throat> we have, well, yeah, normally we try to do monthly events. But um, I don't think we have one planned for next month. So yeah, most likely in April will be our next event. And so far we have um, Grant Gacious is going to give a presentation about some of his work in Cosmic Rays. But yeah, that is what I have for the event. Um, I hope that everybody enjoyed it. Um, so yeah. Thank you for watching.